I should really re-record these earlier in the day. <laughs> so, some ships, some ships we think about and we want to learn about because they're involved in important events that sing out through the ages. Some ships we learn about because they are they are touchstones of their period. Warrior, Dreadnought. Those sort of vessels. Vessels that, when they come out and come into service, they immediately change things which are judged. Some ships we need to learn about because of differences they illustrate. Now, the Formidable, she is the nameship of the Formidable class, which are ordered under the 1897 program. She's built at Portsmouth Dockyard. And really, her design is all about the incremental improvements the Royal Navy really loves to do. The Royal Navy might present itself as going, we do these new amazing things. But the reality is, with both Dreadnought and Warrior, things were tested out in other classes long before they were put together. You know, Dreadnought, I've been over her design origins. I've been over the armoured cruisers, the various vessels carrying the 12-inch guns, all sorts of things which have been done. Turbines were being well used in various other vessels. They just bring it together and go, Yay! Look, we made a great leap into the unknown. And every single component we've tested on something else to be sure it would work before we put it together. There was the chance that we put it all together and it fudged, but, you know, that's a very low risk. When they're doing normal class development, in terms of once they've had this watershed moment, they go, ooh, we're making incremental improvements. We're going to make roughly three major changes. Well, the formidable class are taking the Majestic and the Canopus classes and combining them together on a new hull form. They're taking the size of the Majestic class and its larger size and the Krupp armor of the Canopus class and the new hull form and the higher caliber main and secondary guns i.e. longer. They're 12, Mark 9 12-inch 40 cals, like you find on a fair number of free dreadnoughts, including Japanese vessels, are all very useful. And basically, you end up with a vessel that has better arm protection than either of the classes, that any of the classes that have preceded them, and the high speed of the Canopus class. And that's important, because 18 knots in 1898, when it's launched, is really good. When it's completed and commissioned in 1901, 18 knots isn't bad either. Two triple expansion steam engines. This is all good. This is all capable. Shameless book plug. I know. It's shameless, but... As I've said before in other videos, I'm an academic, but I'm a contract lecturer. Currently, most universities are holding off contracts for the short-term lecturing posts for this academic year to see what they can do and they can't. And, well, I've the one which supposedly was supposed to give me a contract to give me confidence earlier on, so it started in September, has actually paused it. So. Life happens. University, a university market is not as reliable as it used to be for careers for like academics, and history is a really cool area to be involved in. But it's always a case of its seniority, of your time served, and. Also, the thing is, let's be honest, us historians, we love our jobs. We get into it because we're passionate. Trying to get us to retire is frigging impossible. Really, we don't want to go anywhere. We enjoy what we do. So, shameless book plug. I've got an iron brew addiction to feed. And... Always the internet bills. <laughs> but... Here is the thing. The Formidables are the fifth 
class of sovereign star battleships. You might not be quite familiar with that term. I don't call them pre-dreadnoughts. I call them steam battleships and sovereign battleships. Why? You have the ironclad frigates, i.e. the warrior types. And then they evolve into the steam battleships when they no longer have mass, but they don't really have any armor. Then you have the sovereigns, where you start to get something which is actually a recognizable battleship. It's got the guns, it's the, you know, it's the full shape. And those exist on, and pretty much the sovereigns are the first to come in, which emphasizes properly. And then it's incremental improvements on those until you get to the dreadnought. Which is taking all the other ideas put together and going, here's the new type of battleship. And I prefer that as a naming system because it actually makes sense. Because it's whilst it's easier for us looking back to probably classify them as pre dreadnoughts which was a decision made in World War One as an easy way to group together pre dreadnought battleships, dreadnought battleships, you know, that's why. Leaves and completely leaving aside the fact that even Britain is completing so called pre dreadnoughts after dreadnought, so that really doesn't make sense, etc. And then there's the whole semi-dreadnought thing going on. Um, it's it's case of that is us retroactively trying to come up with an Amy scheme which gives us a false impression. Because when we talk with some people, I mean, th this is going to seem strange to people, but I've had this conversation with students in the past who've gone, well, did they know, uh, you know, why were they building a pre-dreadnought when they knew about dreadnought? Well, they didn't know about dreadnought. Dreadnought hadn't been built yet. But how, why are they calling it a pre-dreadnought then? Okay, well that's us, and that's the people post-dreadnought in World War One calling them pre-dreadnoughts to make their lives easier. Makes sense, but not really helpful. So I'm going with I call them sovereigns because it makes sense. You can look up the sovereign class battleships. They're very nice. They're very cute, and they make sense. As a basic point, and I've done an entire video on them. Now, I'm not including Renown as her own extra sixth class because Renown is kind of special. I've done a whole video about HMS Renown, and in my view, she is almost a proto <laughs> proto battlecruiser in some ways, in terms of how Fisher really designs her, and. As such, I'm not really sure I want to include her in the class run of proper of sovereign battleships. She's something that stands out on her own. She's an idea that's coming. She's a gorgeous ship, though. And these were capable vessels, but there is something to think about them. This is there is a trouble in well prior to World War One, and by the way, this is definitely gone by the time you get after World War One. Jutland shoots this one in the foot for any nation which wasn't doing more. And after Toshima, I have to say, Japan especially was always doing more. Uh, if we consider her gunnery trials on 12th of June 1901, carried out under uh, Captain Arthur Barrow of HMS Excellent, she fired five rounds from a 12 inch turret forward and seven from her after turret. 12 rounds in total fired from her guns to uh, for her gunnery trials. That was to work out a check if her guns were working. Then she did some, of course, more re more gunnery drills, and yes, the guns themselves had been proved and tested and had been shared. They'd worked out how many times they could be fired before they did a barrel, or lining re uh, barrel lining replaced. But this is part of the problem of why you end up with the whole shell issue in World War One, at Jutland, etc., for the Royal Navy. The thing that actually, you have to, again, this is a point that's worthwhile thinking about. One of the contributions of BT trying to massively overcompensate for the fact that he failed in his job to give information to Jellicoe, which is, leads to all sorts of troubles at Jutland, is there's an incredible focus on three things. One of them is ship design. The other one is shell reliability and the sort for why he didn't work communications communications reliability this is why the royal navy when it ends up in world war ii and actually quite a lot of allied navies in world war ii from world war one who end up in world war ii 
are also obsessed with shell reliability, ship design, and communications reliability. Because they pick it up off the Royal Navy. Because that's what the message is the Royal Navy saying. Yeah, Jutland would have been great, but we managed to shoot on this, this, this. It's basically... Um, how do I put this politely? Racing driver's excuses. Most people have hopefully have heard that term. But basically, any time you listen to a racing driver explain why they didn't win a race, they will have a list of excuses to blame on. And usually it's something to do with the car. Or the track. Or boat, or the tires, or the car, the track, and the tires. It will be a whole list of litany of issues. Um, you, you might have heard of the phrase uh, "blame the toolmaker, uh, uh, blame uh, blame the user, not the tools." No, they will blame the tools, and it's the same with this. But thing is, with the shells, of course, he was right. BT was right pushing blame on the shells. The shells do have to share a blame. If the shells had worked anywhere like the Green Boys did. There would have never been a problem with them. Never, uh, you know, the world of Jutland itself would have been a very different battle in that there would have been a lot more German casualties, which would possibly have shifted it in terms of results from what was a, you can argue, a strategic win, tactical loss in terms of numbers, tactical win in terms of actual positioning by Jellico through no help at all from BT managed to actually cross the German T twice. That's just I'm not sure if you can even consider that Royal Navy win. That's just Jellico win. Um, that's personal victory of Jellico really. But the thing is it's muddy enough. It is pretty much a draw which is not good for British PR and not good for the German war needs but it shouldn't have been. Because if the shells had worked properly, there would have been a big difference. And one of the problems is there isn't enough testing going on. Why isn't there enough testing going on? Well, there are three reasons there's not enough testing going on. One, it costs money. Firing these guns, doing all this testing, costs money. Two, if you look hard enough, you might actually find something wrong. And a lot of interests are not very keen on stuff being found wrong because they found wrong, it's probably going to eat into their profit margin. I'm sorry for that, but it comes up. One of the few things which isn't able to be built by the Royal Dockyards are guns. The Royal Dockyards can pretty much manufacture on test anything else themselves. They can even do an interesting job with engines, and there's enough competition in the engine market, and the fact you can buy the engines from anyone and get them installed in any ship being built, that you can't afford to be too mucking around. But there is a there are some interesting issues going on with gun manufacturer and shell manufacturer in pretty much every nation in the run-up to World War One. World War One, I would say, changed this. Heavily. Heavily. Mainly because it pushes the onus for the testing on rather than the navies to prove it's not working, than for uh, but for the uh, suppliers to prove it does work. Whereas previously it had been an onus which had shifted, especially during the long 19th century, to the navies having to prove it didn't work. But they're good looking ships, the whole class. Now, so formidable, she's had this testing. She's passed into the fleet reserve officially on the 16th of September, 1901. And then she's commissioned on the 10th of October, 1901. But we'll get into that in a second. Let's consider her outline and let's consider her armor and her styling. The London class are basically a continuation of the Formidable class with some changes made in terms of their armouring. It's... How do I put this politely? 
I'm not really sure I'm keen on the changes that I made to create the London class. Um, but they are a distinct class. As they abandon the forward armor bulkhead. Um, and instead of having the armored bulkhead, they have a armored belt that goes all the way to the bow, to the, what's called the stem. I would myself prefer to have both the armored bulkhead and the armored belt, but they went for one over the other, and that does make a fairly significant change into the profile of the ship. So I would probably say the London's possibly a subclass of the Formidables should be technically, but the Admiralty certainly consider them a bit of a separate class, consider them to be a separate class. So I think you have to accept that. The Admiralty consider them a separate class. They're more, more accurately Formidables batch two with modifications, but they are a separate class. So, what is this ship? Well, displacement-wise, she's an interesting vessel. She really is. She displaces 14,700 tons in metric, that's 14,500 long tons in normal, and 16,100 tons or 15,800 long tons in fully load. She's 431 foot 9 inches. That's 131.6 meters roughly. She is 75 foot in beam. 22.9 meters. Near enough makes no difference. 23 meters almost actually. And 25 foot 11 inches. That's 7.9 meters in draft. That is mean draft because they have interesting, and that's a mean draft across the class. All of them have a slightly interesting profile, and some of them are slightly heavier at the bow for some reason. It affects the London class slightly more. Now, they have 20 water tube boilers that supply two triple expansion engines that drive two. Screw propellers, fire shafts, with 15,000 indicated horsepower, for a top speed of 18 knots, or 5,500 nautical miles at 10 knots. Now, if you think of that, that's 5,000 nautical, uh, 5,500 nautical miles. That's 10,190 kilometers, 6,330 normal miles, at a speed of roughly 12 miles an hour or 19 kilometers an hour. It'll get you a long way. Crew of roughly 780. Again, changes if they're in a flag roll. They can be carrying more. And armed with four of those 12-inch Mark IX guns. Talked about earlier. 40 cal. 12 6-inch Mark Seven guns. 10 quick-firing 12-pounders. 6 quick-firing 3-pounders. And uh, four 18 inch torpedo tubes. And this is where things start to get really interesting. Because the belt is nine inches, the bulkheads are between nine and 12 inches. And you could think about it that the forward bulkhead being so strong, that's a legacy of the Battle of Trafalgar. Ship design after that point was the Royal Navy got in policy of strengthening ships of the fore in case of enemy, so that you could smash through lines and also better receive if the enemy tried to cross your T. That was the entire thinking of the Royal Navy. And you strengthened the fore of the ship so it could bash through a line. You know, you need to do that if you're going to do a Trafalgar style operation. So that's one of the reasons why bulkheads at the front ended up being thicker than bulkheads at the aft. As a rule, sometimes they balance them out, as they've done a bit in this, in the case of this design. But still, it's all 
tracing itself back to Trafalgar. Then we have 10 inch armor on the turrets, 12 inch armor on the barbettes. We have casemates, which are 6 inch thick. A conning tower, which is 14 inches thick. We all know my objection to conning towers, but in, in Sovereign Star battleships, they make sense. The type of battle they are due to be engaging in, how close they are to get to the enemy, it makes sense. And it's between 1 and 3 inches thick deck armor. So that is a solidly built vessel. It really is. One of the really interesting things to think about in terms of the construction of the class, which she did, the London class, and also the pace of construction of the middle, is that she's laid down on 21st of March 1898. She's launched on the 17th of November 1898. Not quite complete. And she's launched primarily because she's, launched, she's in good enough condition, they can now launch her and clear the slipway, so they can begin constructing HMS London. Literally, they speed her construction so they can get onto the next class. Which also shows the capacity of the British Yards. They're able to do this. They're able to speed construction. Think about that from when talking about infrastructure and capacity of Yards. They have the ability to race through construction in peacetime. Under peacetime conditions, just because the Navy would like London in sooner than later. They'd like to try out that design. The idea of having the armour go right belt all the way to the stem. And to be fair, that's one of the reasons why it's such a long time between her launch date, November 1898, and her being signed off as being completed in September 1901, after testing. Because of the fact that she was launched and she wasn't really ready for it. Not a norm position ready. Anyway. She's commissioned into the Mediterranean fleet. And how she's commissioned is quite interesting. Uh, Captain Alexander William Chrisholm Ban, cool name, pays off HMS Resolution. Now, Resolution is a very nice Royal Sovereign class. I heard about that, I mentioned those earlier. Battleship. He pays off her on the 9th of October for her to go into refit and, I think, some maintenance. And his, he and his entire crew are turned over as a whole to Formidable on the 10th of October. So basically, they take... they put one crew a ship into refit and they take the entire crew and they move them from one ship to the other ship with a night's gap they change their cap tallies and they go from being resolutioners to formidables again something you can do when you have sufficient strength of force you can do that. You can also do that when you don't have to worry so much about giving people leave. Because there aren't attractive tech jobs. They can go and earn a lot more money and not have to be, you know, stuck away for months on end away from their family. If you consider a sailor in this period, if they go ashore, what's their likelihood of job? Their best job prospects? Probably it's Merchant Navy. Yeah, they could get other work. Would it be as regular pay, as reliable pay? 19, early 1900s? Possibly not. So, in September 1902, she visits the Aegean. She's attached to the Mediterranean fleet. And takes part in combined manoeuvres near Napulia which is in the Peloponnese in Greece. It's a nice place to go if you have to, and frankly, again, it's the Royal Navy doing this because regularly they need to show off next to Greece because they worry about the Ottoman Empire. 
And also, they want to also remind their ally exactly who they're dependent upon should anything happen. So please don't start anything we won't support you in. It works. It does work. It's not nice. But there again, most of the diplomacy in international relations is not nice. Most of it is stark. And most of it is uh, who loses least, rather than who wins. The next year, 1903, she's the escort ship for His Majesty's Yacht, Victorian Albert. And it really is a His Majesty. Um, it's 1903. It's for one of the times it's not a King George, it's a King Edward. It's King Edward VII, if I'm not 100% wrong. It's Victoria's son. Yes, Edward VII. And, um, yeah, she has a nice time with him. Then she has a refit from... 1904 till 1905 at Malta. Doesn't need to come home to the UK. Has a full year's refit, pretty much, in Malta. Then she's there for another three years. She's paid off at Chan Dockyard on the 7th of August, 1908. And this is when she starts another refit so she goes into refit 7th of August 1908 and pretty much is recommissioned on the 20th of April 1909 so yeah that's what we're talking another good 6 8 month refit yes 8 month refit roughly and that's about appropriate for a ship of this time period this is what you're looking at so again, when you're talking about the large fleets of this period, just imagine that usually between every three to every four years, these ships go in for a major refit and overhaul. And honestly, modern ships probably should do as well, but you try getting, you try getting enough money out of... Well, then the governments are taxpayers to fund ships sitting in yards being refitted again. When they seem brand spanking new, because, you know, the ten argument, and you will hear this. If you are ever lucky enough to attend a defense bait, you will hear this, people going, well, I don't have to put my car in for refit every three years, why do you have to put your ship in for refit? Or plane. When you try to explain that the average car A goes in for servicing every year, etc., and various things, and its size and complexity versus a many thousand ton ship, which has is a systems of systems, and many complicated systems which are far more complicated than your entire car on it, and the fact that it's operating in an environment where salt water is actively trying to dissolve it, the seas are actively trying to sink it. And that's before you even get on to the whole thing of the enemy and their vote. And the fact that weapon systems, when you're firing them, even when you're practicing, they're going to put tremendous strain on the vessel and themselves and are going to have to be fixed at certain points and rejigged. All these things are kind of complicated and require a lot of work, and tends to be quite a lot of stuff gets saved up until the major refit. Why? Because you want to open up parts of the hull, have large cranes, lift it in and out, and look at it, or replace it. This all takes a lot of time, and costs money. But it also means you end up needing a lot more ships to be able to cover the same amount of operations because you've got to factor in the ships which are in refit into your numbers. So a navy doesn't have, let's say, it has a force of 24 ships. It really doesn't. In most periods, when you're looking at a force, if they said they have 24 of any type of ship, about six of those are going to be in major refit. 
Maybe as little as four, possibly as many as eight. Of them, another six are going to be actively on station. Again, maybe as little as four, maybe as many as eight. Another six are going to be probably training up. Or in the process of preparing to go to station. Uh, and again, same rule. And the final six are going to be either transiting between stations. Or returning home. Or in short refits. I.e. the kind of refits where you go in and you change out all your ammunition. You restock the, fu the food, the fuel, those things. Very quickly, that's what you find is your peacetime ratio. In wartime, you, of course, don't tend to do the major refits. So your fleet goes down to a third out at sea, a third in training or transferring to, and a third in what are the refits quick scenario. But in peacetime, it's usually quarters. So you think about that, from your 24 ships, you have roughly six doing the job you want them to do in peacetime. So if your standard is you need four escorts for a carrier battle group nucleus and you have six standing patrol commitments, so you need ten vessels on station at 100% availability at any one time. If you work back from that, you need roughly 40 escorts. That's just maps. beautiful like that but then you're going to be explaining to people and having to explain to the newspapers on a regular basis who seem to very rarely have people like well my colleague from armored carriers Jamie Seedell who are actually defense specialists writing defense news anytime I see an actual defense specialist writing defense news I am I'm shocked sadly enough not all of them seem to be capable of transposing from one service to another they tend to some of them seem to be very, very single service. No idea. And I know this is off topic, but I'm getting in, uh, getting back to topic. And so they will spend a lot of time going half the fleet or a quarter of the fleet in the dry dock at the moment, not available. Well, yeah, they need to be maintained. Basically, a ship being in dry dock is the equivalent of it being going taken into your garage. If you are a person who, I don't know, has a high-performance car or anything, a tractor or anything like that which works for a living, you will know, well know how often you need to get your machinery serviced and get it looked after. Well, imagine something many, many times more complicated than that with all sorts of electrical stuff which can also go wrong and also doesn't like salt water on it. Now... Why is she having such a major work, though, again, three years later? Well, because she's being transferred to the home forces. And this is where things get interesting for her, because, honestly, people have bright ideas. <laughs> and this is mostly due to the press. If you want to see the greatest press battle the Navy fights in the run-up to World War One, that is actually an ongoing issue of the press, it's the name of what the forces should be based around the UK. She starts off with the home fleet stationed at North. Then she's transferred to the Atlantic fleet, which pretty much takes over as the primacy and primary fleet. And there is also the whole Fisher problems going on with his various opponents in the Royal Navy. I know, I know. But it's not just about his fighting with Beresford over whether or not the Channel Fleet, uh, Channel's fleet is the strongest squadron that actually exists. There's actually a problem of where to base the fleets and where they're supposed to be organised and how you support the infrastructure for them. But also, it's how do you make the case for the home fleet. The Mediterranean fleet is easy to make a case of. It's our grandstanding. But... If you call the home fleet the North Sea Fleet, that can be is interpreted by some politicians as being too aggressive to the Germans. 
I know, we're in a naval race with them and it's still too aggressive. However, others, if you caught the home fleet, but do we need another fleet to cover the Atlantic? Okay, let's call the Atlantic fleet. But then what have we got covering the home? If at any point you can imagine that some admirals wish to carry a baseball bat and whack people round the head, you would be understanding their feelings. But all of this was due to the fears which were arising, because a lot of people were suddenly realising, especially post-Dreadnought, how far ships have been getting. And they kept being scares about the idea of people being rapidly loaded onto ocean liners and troops would descend rapidly into ports. Now, this is a lovely idea, but there's, there's two small problems with it. One, an ocean liner is not a very good landing ship. Two, if you do want to land, uh, land, if you do want to carry out landing from it, you're either going to be using boats off a beach, which is going to be very long, or you're going to have to steam into someone's port. Now, whilst it would be interesting to do as a exercise, if you consider the major ports in Britain where they were, and have a think about just how many troops you could bring on a single ocean liner. Versus the size of the cities they would be landed into. Versus the rather large population of dockers. With lots of cranes and various other things. And those dockers' propensity for not enjoying people telling them what they're doing. And what to do. And getting in their way. I'm not quite sure that a single ocean liner turning up in any harbour would actually help. And also, especially as you could actually delay it if you got any wind of it by just asking him to stay out at sea until you had a suitable berth available. Then they arrive, come storming down into the face of machine guns and artillery arranged along the port, arranged uh, to see them and go, "Hello, would you like to surrender now?" But these sorts of things were the features of regular scares. And almost every time there's a scare or something going around the papers, someone announces a name change of what will be the primary fleet for Britain's home defence. This is how the Grand Fleet eventually comes to be. Rather than calling it the Home Fleet or the Atlantic Fleet, no, it needs to go with the status, and the Germans have the High Seas Fleet, which can get into the North Sea. At least they didn't call it the High Oceans Fleet. But, yeah, there is a whole load of PR going on. There's a whole load of battle. And HMS Formidable is there for all this. She's involved in all of it. And the point is... These things aren't new. These issues with communication for defence matters and for explaining them to a public are not new. That's hardly unsurprising. But again, it's worthwhile remembering it. Because every time we treat a problem as being brand new, we ignore the lessons of the past. Usually these things are new in nuance and context, perhaps, but not new in actuality. Now, HMS Formidable, of course, took part in all these. In May 1912, she's reduced to what's called a nucleus crew. Now, a nucleus crew is when you just have a core of regular personnel who basically exists on the ship to keep it going and keep everything functioning. The rest of the crew will come from reserves. And she's transferred to what at that time was the 5th Battle Squadron, which was based in the 2nd Fleet of the Home Fleets. The Home Fleets now, at North. You have the Channel Fleet, the Atlantic Fleet, and the Home Fleet, so it's just... There is so much, what do you call it, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, going on with the naming of these horses. 
y you almost wonder if someone is literally going, right then, so we have got the money to produce... They, they are funding us building all these dreadnoughts. They're funding us building all these ships. And yet they're more reassured by us changing the name of the fleet that's going to be coordinating them? Yes. Is this the public who are more reassured, or the people who want, who are searching for something to print to make tomorrow's fish paper? Don't know. Who knows? But, it's what they did. And so, she was at the Nor when war broke out in August 1914. One of the issues, though, that happened, though, was while she was under the nucleus crew scenario, she had a lot of steaming going on and some of it actually managed to develop uh, some of it was actually so hard it actually led to her developing um, some interesting machinery issues now I would say those machinery issues can be overstated a lot of ships which were nucleus crews had this problem because you'd often have quite a high rate of turnover of nucleus crews in that you'd have good people in them and you'd want them actually in your ships and especially your new dreadnoughts but you also couldn't afford to have bad people to maintain the nucleus of these ships because otherwise they'd fall apart so you basically would draft people in to make sure it was okay and then draft them out as quickly as possible this turnover meant that there's a loss of I would say a loss of understanding necessarily the engines the engines are still to an extent in this point a little bit of art as well as science in fact I'd say there's still quite a heavy lot of a little bit of art in the modern engines as just as well as science and the institutional memory needs to be preserved the stuff which isn't necessarily always written down and when you have a high turnover you don't get it written down and so this leads to some hard steaming the engines not being treated as they perhaps need to be treated not fettered in the right way and that leads to issues in lots of ships. Again, this is something to think about. This is nothing new. If we consider when you are holding on reserve ships, you have an issue. You either completely mothball them and seal them up like the Americans did, but then you have the problems of reactivation, and sometimes you have grease and all sorts of stuff in places which you need to clear out, and then it's getting them actually going again, etc. Or you have a nucleus crew and you keep the thing with running, but then how do you you have to deal with the impacts of the turnover and the fact that by those people running it might not not necessarily be as familiar with systems as you would like them to be with it, and they might actually push things too hard or do things problem in a not the right correct order and damage it. That is your issue. It's a useful vessel in reserve. But, yeah. Now. She is lost in Model 1. And this is another reason I picked on her. Because of how she's lost. When Model 1 begins, Formidable and the remainder of 5th Battle Squadron are based at Portland. They are assigned to the Channel Squadron, Channel Fleet, and they consist of HMS Prince of Wales, HMS Bulwark, HMS Implacable, Irresistible, Formidable, London, Queen, and Venerable. Now, if you're thinking, Alex, well, how are these squadrons grouped together? Well, they're pretty much the five London class and the three Formidable class, which is one of the reasons why, again, I treat them as... So, to an extent, one class, because they are grouped together as one squadron of battleships. And the Royal Navy, in this period, when they were building the Royal, uh, Royal Sovereign types, tended to build battleship squadron, uh, battleships in squadrons. I were building a squadron of battleships to work together. So they built eight to work together.
Now, these vessels, they're called upon. They have a duty. They are assigned to cover the British Expeditionary Forces' movements to France in August 1914. Formidable herself carries a Marine Battalion from Portsmouth to Ostend on the 25th of August. And then in November, they're rebased at Sheerness because, again, worries over a German invasion of Great Britain. On the 30th of December, they are relieved by the Duncan-class vessels of the 6th Battle Squadron, and so are transferred back to Portland. They're being moved around literally because of worries about a German invasion in World War One. It's one of those things which you often overlook. World War One has its own German invasion scares and German invasion fears. When the German army is stretched, putting every troop it can, every trooper it can, to fight the two fronts, the Western Front and the Eastern Front, there is honest fears going around in newspapers and other parts of Britain about the Germans also managing to put together enough troops to invade Britain. You could argue that maybe they don't need that many, but again, where are they going to go? How are they going to do it? Think about it logistically. I know in a alternate history, I did look at the possibility that Germany could have invaded France by the sea instead of going through Belgium if they'd had the support of the British. And yes, if they'd had the support of the British, they could have done that. Or at least the active non-involvement of the British to the level of, we're not involved, but here there's coal and please use our ports if anything emergency happens. That's the level of that scenario. The reality of trying to invade Britain in World War One, you're going to need to magic up extra troops from somewhere, and a lot of them. In December 1914, the Royal Navy appoints Vice Admiral Sir Lewis Bailey, at that point, command of the Channel Fleet. Now, what I'm going to talk about is events that take place in December. What people tend to remember of him is that in 1915 he's made, made senior officer on the coast of Ireland at Queenstown. 1917, that title becomes commander in chief the coast of Ireland, and he holds his post until 1919, working often with the British American force, which was defending the West, uh, defending the Western approaches. Now, as his chief of staff. He had a gentleman called Captain Joel R.P. Pringle of the U.S. Navy during that role, and he built up a very good relationship with William Sims. He was a very good political admiral. He was a very good working admiral at that level. He was also massively paranoid about submarines by that point. And the reason, therefore, I am not objecting to his promotion for that is because he learns that the hard way. There are a lot of officers who are not prepared for World War I when it happens. Their career has not started. They, he'd fought in the Third Anglo-Asante War. He'd fought in the Anglo-Egyptian War. And then he fights in the First World War. This, some of the, a lot of these officers have a good reason for not being prepared for the realities of war. His experience of command had been cruisers, battle cruisers, battle squadrons. So, he took, under his direct command, the 5th Battle Squadron out for a battle, a gunnery exercise, battle exercise, on the 31st of December 1914, in the English Channel, off the Isle of Portland. He, there is a debate as to whether he requested destroyer escort or not. I would say my own view is he didn't 
the argument is, he said, did he think he talked to another officer and said, well, do you think it's necessary? That's not requesting it. He did have two light cruisers of the Topaz class. Now, the Topaz class were lovely ships, but they were built in 1903-05 and are classified as protected cruisers. Third class protected cruisers. So, they're not really probably the vessels you want to be doing sub hunting in at that time because they weigh 3,000 tons and they can do a maximum speed of 22 knots. But he has two of those, Topaz and Diamond, with him. But they have no destroyer escort, and you can guess what's going to happen. After the exercises were over, the fleet remained at sea on patrol, even though submarine activity had been reported in the area. This comes from the report, and yes, even though submarine activity is reported, Bailey doesn't think let's go to port. Add to that. Visibility that night was good, and the sea was just rough enough to make detection of a submarine difficult, but to not make their job of attacking you difficult. I.e., a very rough sea makes the, it a very big problem for a submarine to attack you. But if it's rough enough that you're not going to be able to see, necessarily pick out it or maybe even on the surface, let alone it using its periscope, you're in trouble. And then we have the final problem. Because Bailey doesn't seem to think there is any danger, and his staff don't seem to think there is any danger, his ships are steaming in line ahead formation at a speed of 10 knots. Formidable is the last of the battleships line and she only has the two cruisers behind her so the cruisers aren't even off to the wings spotting for submarines that could be uh, trying to line up there there's not even any positioning that all the ships are in one line basically you have just set up a shooting gallery and you are the targets now for most of the day, uh, evening afternoon evening time they had managed to being stalked by u24 German submarine. It stalks them well into the night and managed to line up for pretty much a perfect shot. At 0220 hours on the 1st of January 1915, roughly 20 miles from Star Point, she is hit by a torpedo on the starboard side, which quickly gives her a list of 20 degrees. Now, her captain the wonderfully named Arthur Noel Loxley is on deck. He has with him his Fox Terrier Bruce and he immediately starts trying to save his ship. First thing is he tries to head to shore. He tries to get her going to shore as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, 45 minutes later She's struck by a second torpedo fired by U-24. Because guess what? With no destroyers, no one can do frigating anything. No one has been going around looking for a submarine. They've just been concentrating on the ship, which is in trouble. Now, a pinnace, a launch, two of the other boats, uh, one of which sadly capsized soon after, were launched. And the two light cruisers managed to pick up 80 men. She remained afloat till 0445 hours. Captain Loxley went down for his ship. On the bridge, still giving orders, still trying to get his crew off his ship, his fox terrier by his side. Various other vessels, including a Brixham trawler, the Provident, 
uh, try to pick up men from the launch and from the sea before it, uh, before it sank. And the total loss of life was 35 officers and 512 men out of 780. Bruce, the Fox Terrier, was washed ashore and is buried in a marked grave in Abbotsbury Gardens in Dorset. Unfortunately for the Loxleys, this isn't, wasn't their only loss due to war. His son, um, Peter Noel Loxley, was one of those killed in an aircraft accident on the 1st of February 1945, whilst on the way to represent Britain at the Yalta Conference. The Admiralty conducted a full inquiry into the loss. And the, their determination was that the risk of them conducting train exercises in the channel without destroyer protection was excessive and shouldn't be continued, unsurprisingly. Bailey was technically received the command of the Channel Fleet, uh, received, uh, <coughs> relieved of command of the Channel Fleet, for not taking adequate protection against a submarine attack, and that is one of the reasons why it's really quite interesting his career afterwards. Because what they do is they make him president of the Royal Navy College in Greenwich because they're not sure what to do with him. Um, Technically, he hadn't done anything wrong, because no one had any standing orders against it, but he also hadn't ex exercised proper judgment. So, yeah. And then, in July 1915, they make him, as said, the senior officer of the coast of Ireland. And the titles grow up. And he becomes very focused on anti-submarine warfare and protection. But, the point which is really worthwhile remembering, and I am double checking dates before I say it, the point that's really worth remembering is that this event happens months after the 22nd of September 1914. Which those who have watched this channel for years will know, because I talk about it often, is a scene of the darkest memory of the Royal Navies in World War One, and something which dominates their thinking for much of World War Two. It's the loss of Abaca, Cressy, and Hogue, three cruisers, to one submarine. It's the loss of nearly one and a half thousand dead along with the free armoured cruisers. They had no destroyer escort. They were out wandering around in the North Sea, trying to uh, acting as part of the blockade of Germany. So whilst I applaud Bailey for him becoming such an ardent supporter of anti-submarine warfare and becoming such a convert, and becoming such a person who thinks it through. I honestly have serious problems, and this is why I discuss HMS Formidable so often, with a concept that with roughly, let's, let's be nice, let's say October, November, December, three months, three full months, thinking after such an event that it was considered in any way, shape or form appropriate for such vessels to be at sea without an escort. This is not to say they are immobile without an escort, but this is to be a point of reality. A fleet's strength is not in any one single unit. A fleet is in strength is in its cumulative force. I 
you have your destroy in this period you have your torpedo boat destroyers okay destroyers you have your cruisers and you have your battleships even half a dozen destroyers as an escort positioned around even to honest the cruisers positioned on the beams you know, you know abreast the formation would have made a difference could have made a massive difference okay it might have meant one of the cruisers of the vessels hit rather than the battleships which makes me sound evil to say it but a topaz class has a crew of 318 It's a lot smaller and it costs a lot less. And it's a lot easier to replace. And hopefully you can rescue those crew. You lost a good captain. You lost a good dog. You lost a useful ship. Because let's be honest, the rest of the class go off and do some very interesting service in the Mediterranean after this. Because someone didn't think things through. And yes, there are pressures of war. And okay, yes, Bailey shouldn't necessarily take all the blame. He should also put the blame on his staff. But unfortunately, he's the officer in command. It's his name on the can, so he has to carry it. I can forgive a lot in history. I always believe you read history forward. You don't judge people with the benefits of hindsight. I will never believe that you should do it in any other way. Judging someone with hindsight, judging someone by necessarily a strict adherence to modern interpretation of moral values doesn't really serve you well when looking through history and trying to understand their thinking their thought process. It's also one of the reasons why I prefer to use recognizance rather than reconnaissance. Why? Because that's how the Royal Navy spoke at a time. Why? Because the Royal Navy likes to recognize something rather than reckon they know it. That was their actual phraseology around it. So when I use the phrase recognizance, when I write the phrase recognizance, that is what I'm talking about. And that has a slightly different connotation. You might go, well, hang on, modern reconnaissance, we do focus in on... Yes. But that wasn't their interpretation at the time. So it's worthwhile to understand their thinking to think using their vocabulary. But there are three months. See, you can't say it's like, it didn't happen the day before and he was going, oh, I don't have a destroyer score on me. No, three months. He's had warnings. There are submarine activities in here. There are quite a lot of ports along the Channel Coast where he could have put into. He could have changed his sailing order. There are lots of things he could have done. And yes, he goes on to achieve great things and work very hard and be well, well deserving of his reputation. If he is a good example of the losses at a time, does make you wonder how many, even at this point in the war, were still asleep about the realities of the conflict they were in versus the conflict their prior service had exposed them to. Right. I always finish these videos with a question, and I want to have one now. So, Sovereign-type battleships. There are many people who detract on Rome and talk about how they couldn't really be used much in Model 1, but they're also quite useful. Securing the Channel Fleet, going off and doing stuff, Dardanelles, etc. They, if they'd been used properly, could have done real, really very valuable service. And 
people are often asking questions about, you know, what happens if some of them survive into World War II, and of course the Greek ones do. But I've often wondered, a more interesting thing is, what happens if some enterprising soul gets nations like the Greek and the Greeks, etc. involved in it, and adds a layer to the treaties for pre-dreadnought battleships. Not even, as they were calling them at the time, because that's what they're calling them post-World War One, because of the dreadnought, and because of the ease for news. So if some people ask, uh, add in a treaty for pre-dreadnought, or maybe calling them second-class battleships, and adds them in as part of the treaty, and brings in Greece and maybe a couple of other nations which have them, into the Washington Naval Treaty. First of all, what do you think of it? Secondly, what do you think might I do? If, let's say, Britain and America are each allowed to keep equal numbers of sovereign types in service if they want to. Or would Britain and America try and exchange those sovereign types for equivalent tonnage of extra dreadnought types? What kind of chicanery do you think would be going on? I'd be interested to hear. Right, what else have we got coming up? I know what is the next one of these. You're going to enjoy it. But next one we've got coming up in terms of key ships. No, this is the year of technology stuff. And we've had building... Uh, we've had stabilizing. Oh, it's building the lessons of World War II into the new Cold War reality. Yeah, it's going to be some interesting looking ships. Basically, some Soviet ships, Soviet designs, some British designs, some French designs, and some American designs are going to be looked at. It's an interesting video. Which I will probably re-record at least twice before it comes out. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'm hungry. Hmm. I've eaten all my cashew nuts. Dang. Have I eaten all my cheese straws? Hmm. Yep. Ah, oh, that's annoying.